Brown. Yeah, you're okay. recording. You got okay. it. Okay, we're recorded and uh, take it away, Shelly. Thank you, Marilyn. Hi, everybody. Hope you're all having or you know, had a nice holiday, whatever you're celebrating. It's nice to see you all. Thank you for coming again. You know, it's interesting. I I, uh, I was telling Marilyn, I just finished a section at FAU on German contemporary film, and this was one of the films. And I didn't plan it this way, but it seems serendipitous uh, that this film and the next one we'll be doing uh, are here now, uh, considering the situation uh, in our world, in our world, uh, its, its relevance. Also, there's a sound somewhere. Also okay. relevant is, oh, please mute yourselves while we're talking. Thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, what's also relevant is just two days ago, we learned that uh, Ben Ferenc, uh, if you've been reading about him or heard about him, he was, he was the lawyer that prosecuted uh, the Nazi regime back in Nuremberg. He was a young lawyer. And uh, he was successful, although I have to say that in quotes, he was successful at prosecuting a number of high-ranking Nazi officials. However, they managed to escape long prison sentences. And some, in some cases, they escaped death uh, sentences uh, because of what was happening in Germany post-war. Uh, but that's another story. And if you want, after this, we can get into it. Anyway, the Last Supper, Das uh, Eats a Mal is the German title, which is, refers to the last meal. Uh, it is uh, from Germany from 2018, directed by a young man. His name is Florian Freirich. Florian Freirich. This was his feature film debut, his feature film debut, providing a fascinating edge uh, to an historical moment. And considering current events, as I just mentioned, the scary one, a scary one. The start date, this is an interesting note to when it came out in Germany. The start date and the title of the film were deliberately chosen. German cinemas usually release their films on Wednesdays. But the last meal opened in German cinemas a day earlier than usual on January 30th, 2018, a Tuesday. That was the same day, January 30th was the same day that the National Socialists seized power in 1933. The timing is doubly relevant. On the one hand, of course, it affects the day of the theatrical release. They're releasing on a Tuesday, but January 30th, a Tuesday in 2018, when it debuted, was a day earlier than, as I said, than films open, and it was the anniversary of Hitler's seizure of power. But the film, as it quickly becomes clear, wants to be more than just a reminder of what once was. More than just a reminder of what once was. It also sees itself as a warning of what is to come, what may come, if we are not diligent. It is interesting to note that the Glicksteins are a fictional family. While they interact or are discussing very real people, very real people are mentioned in the film. So it combines actual truth, actual history with this fiction. In the prologue to the dinner, we first read on the screen, the German Jewish call to serve the fatherland in World War I. Incidentally, 100,000 Jews served in World War I out of conviction. Tens of thousands died. And 21 years later, those who did survive would be put into death camps. Is it the irony of all of the Jews that served in World War I and then would be executed, those who survived would be executed years later? We then cut to, and they give us the time, 8.38 a.m. on January 30th, 1933, with the color footage of a bustling Berlin during the period. As the camera focuses on the Olympia Club, uh, which was a real club uh, in Berlin, a popular Jewish club, with the real Max Liebman, the character you see at the beginning, one of Germany, if not one of the world's great artists, 
Uh, for those of you who don't know about him, he was one of the world's great artists. Uh, he uh, was a, a big proponent of uh, German uh, Impressionism. And also uh, he was a portrait artist, very well-known portrait artist. And he was also a, uh, a leading member of the German community, not just the Jewish community. He's a well-respected member of the German community. Uh, and he's listening to the news of the coalition government, and he's disgusted. By the way, he actually said, he did say in his diary the line that he, he says to Glickstein. He says, when he says, I could not eat as much as I would like to throw up when he heard about Hitler. He actually said that uh, when he would watch the parade that evening. Uh, he had written in his diary, which was, which was published years later. Uh, and when he mentions two other names during that morning meeting, uh, Hugo Preuss and Walter Rathenau, they were two uh, important Jewish political figures. Rathenau had served as the foreign minister in the Weimar Republic and was assassinated in 1922 by a, an ultranational secret organization, which were forerunners to the Nazis. It is here that we first meet Aaron. Aaron Glickstein, who reminisces with Liebman about family. And Aaron eventually learns that a man who was going to inject money into his business has died. If you remember, he gets the phone, the, the message. And then we move into the opening titles of the film. That was a prologue to the film. It sets us up. We move into those opening titles, which were a wonderful montage of pictures depicting life and famous personalities. If you happen to be notice. We saw Peter Lorre among the pictures. If you remember, his picture stood out. Uh, and pictures of Berlin and culture that would soon disappear, that would soon disappear. We see Michael's room in that opening montage with a poster on the wall of the Fritz Lang dystopian science, science fiction film, uh, Metropolis. And then the camera goes down into his trunk where we see uh, the newspapers who, that were praising Hitler. Another hint of what, what might be coming for him. We also meet Aaron's brother, Daniel, a doctor, and his wife, Monica, a screenwriter, who longs to go to Hollywood. There is Sarah, Aaron's sister, who is a communist. Leah, Aaron's daughter. Rebecca, his wife. And Jacob and Ruth, Aaron's father and mother. Now, it's, it's uh, you know, this is a chamber piece, if you will. It's, it, it could be a play. It could be a play uh, because it's mostly set in that one room, in that one dining room. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, they are uh, not stereotypes. They are archetypes. We're introduced to archetypes uh, in the beginning of the film. There were those Germans that are already planned to get out. Uh, Jewish Germans who had planned to get out at that moment, and, and Daniel and his wife represent two of them. Sarah, as a communist, represents those feelings. So we know that when we see at the table all this crosstalk, uh, we understand where it's coming from. Each one has their own ideal so to speak. It only lasts a few minutes at the beginning that the celebratory dinner has only just begun when the sentence is already spoken, that should make you uncomfortable, makes us all uncomfortable. Hitler is finally speaking plain language, they say, only saying what many people think, somebody mentions. He only says what other people think, uh, but don't say to themselves. Uh, parallels to the current right wing uh, and this is a reference to today, and this is why the director puts it in. He even says in interviews, parallels to the current right wing of the Bundestag, known as the AFD, or alternate German party, are obvious for the German audience, uh, as are what references to our own situation here. Uh, when we hear these kinds of words, we can certainly reference them. When the Glickstein family from Berlin met for dinner at Aaron's home, uh, no one suspected the consequences. That's an important thing to remember. No one suspected the consequences of Adolf Hitler's appointment as Reich Chancellor. The point is, 
They don't know what's to come. We do. We're dealing with hindsight. They don't have the foresight yet to believe, you know, because it's unbelievable in their minds what would happen. And that's what we have to remember when we watch the movie, that they don't know what's to come. They don't know what's to come. And we hear it in the conversation. While Aaron's parents, Jacob and Ruth, dismiss the National Socialists as loudmouths, his communist sister, Sarah, loudly warns that it cannot be laughed off so easily. And his brother, uh, or the rabbi, Benjamin, calmly warns of the possible consequences of the election. Still, others are thinking of emigrating. Aaron's brother, Daniel, and his girlfriend, Monica, as, as his wife, Monica, as I said, want to go to the U.S. Aaron's 19-year-old daughter, Leah, uh, has already discussed going to Palestine with her mother. Uh, and a younger brother, Michael, on the other hand, is an ardent supporter of Hitler and wants nothing more than to attend the announced torchlight procession through the Capitol. What the director and his co-screenwriter uh, who was his university history professor, by the way. He, uh, he wrote this with his professor. What they've accomplished is condensed the fate of the Jewish family into a political chamber play. Without knowing what is to come, its members come together one last time. This would be their last meal together. Each of the figures represents a different position, as I said, and the ideological fronts have hardened have hardened in each of them. This historical arrangement with echoes of the Last Supper is daring as, it always, as, as it's always revealing, not to mention resonant and quite relevant, uh, not just to Germans, but for us as well. Uh, Friericks and Warnach, the writers, managed to make clever references to our own present situations through their point of dialogue. I know I was thinking of certain people uh, and Germans, as well as Germans thinking of their own problems with the AFD, the very right wing alternative party, but I couldn't help, and I don't know about you, uh, but I couldn't help thinking of our own situation here. Uh, the chapters of the film follow the menu order. That was another clever device. Uh, if, as the members of the family think the world still seems fine, along with the first item of clear chicken broth with root, root vegetables, we will see that it is in ruins by the time dessert comes around with the flowing red fruit jelly over the vanilla sauce. Uh, the red on the white uh, is a clear metaphor. And a subplot involving Aaron's efforts to stave off bankruptcy bring him to again dealing with another real historical figure, the man he calls Sigmund Lowe on the phone, who invented the TV, who actually did invent the TV tube in Germany. He even predicts the idea of film to television transmission. If you remember when he talks to him, someday they'll be sending films to television. How ironic, as that is the way we all watch this film. That is the way we all watch this film. Uh, much of The Last Supper is intentional, very obviously intentional. The drama has set itself the task of dealing with the many very contradictory views that came with the beginning of the Third Reich, all in one go. The screenwriter, uh, I, again, chose a family for this. That's where everything comes together. That's where the most diverse currents are reflected. In addition, the film attempts an ambitious interplay the private and the political merge with each other. Small injuries can be the basis for big views or what some consider grand views. Uh, there is a samba yet feminist moment between Ruth and Rebecca, the scene between Ruth and Rebecca, between uh, daughter-in-law and mother-in-law and how Ruth tells her daughter-in-law, men live their lives at battles. War is just one aspect, work is another. It's up to us women to stand behind them and sometimes to lead them. Unfortunately, that's not the way things would work out. Uh, but it is, it is his pointed way of saying women seem to understand these situations a lot better than men do. 
unfortunately, at that point in time, they were also, she's also referring to the fact that Aaron, which we get a hint of, had his peccadillos. If you remember when he was on the phone with that secretary of, of Lowe's, uh, he was having, you know, sort of telling of things uh, about their affair. Especially interesting is the argument Aaron has when he's trying to reason with his son, Michael. Despite what Aaron tells him, Michael cites the protocols of elders of Zion and Hitler's that the Jews are perpetrators of a global conspiracy, especially the bankers, uh, he says. He even goes so far as to believe the lie that the Nazis believe Jews will be necessary to the new order we see how Aaron begins to sense that his world is crushing around him. Listening to his son, he is incredulous. How could you believe this? He says to him. And what is most poignant is is again, a short time after when Aaron and Benjamin out on the terrace are discussing, uh, are having their discussion. Even the rabbi says, hopefully it'll all pass. This will all pass. And that was their feeling at this time. This will all pass. He mentions that Mein Kampf will go down as the least read bestseller of all time. Mein Kampf should go down as the least read bestseller of all time. And Aaron replies, if nobody reads it, it can't be doing any harm. If nobody reads it, it can't be doing any harm. Well, surprise, surprise. And the rabbi's answer, as if they do what it says in there, God help us, God help us. And despite Aaron's response that the Jews have a grand history in Germany, Benjamin replies, it's not the history I'm worried about, it's the future. And they move on to discussing that film of the poster we saw at the beginning on Michael's wall, Metropolis. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it is a silent film epic. Uh, and it was directed by Fritz Lang. Fritz Lang, who was half Jewish and deserted Germany uh, during those months when Hitler took power. Uh, and he saw the future back in 1919 when he did the film uh, because it, it, it portrays the idea of enslavement. Anyway, uh, and, and when they discuss it, Benjamin's belief that what is coming could be a hundred times worse than what the film portrays. And again, Aaron replying, it's only a film. It's only a film. And as like, this is only a film. And as they turn their backs on the torchlight procession to the Reichstag, Benjamin references Nietzsche. And he says that the Germans consume too much beer and Wagner and Wagner. They consume too much beer and Wagner. And in the end, we're left seeing the aftermath of that procession. We see a brief moment of it, and those were the real films of it. The streets now are in disarray. The warning signs, warning signs of the hatred of the Jews written on a store window. Um, we, see, we see our sister running through the streets. Uh, avoiding a group of Nazis, and Aaron searching for his son. Aaron now going out searching for his son, and we see Michael sitting on a streetcar, pondering his own fate. Uh, Freericks considers his staging for the back and forth discussions carefully and with a good feeling for his ensemble. Quietly and level-headed, without raising a finger, the last meal reminds its audience not to blindly rely on 70 years of democracy. Remember, this is Germans talking to Germany. Do not blindly rely on 70 years of democracy. To look closely and listen carefully in political discourse and not to carelessly label intellectual arsonists as drummers, shouters, and jokers. To dismiss, don't dismiss them so easily. Ultimately, the Last Supper is a political chamber play, as I said, that looks into the past, present, and future. It provides moments with too much to think about afterwards. It has a great deal to say, especially since so many of us are witnessing recognizable signs of the world hurtling in a very bad direction. This may have been the last meal together for the Glicksteins, 
but it certainly won't be the last meal of its kind. The director Florian Freerich's feature film debut is an important admonishing drama and is all the more astonishing even that the film was financed entirely without funding. The film was financed entirely without funding, uh, which is an interesting event because usually the government sponsors these films. Anyway, I thought the performances were very, really very well done. Uh, I thought the detail in the film, it had an expressionist, almost a German expressionist kind of feeling uh, to a lot of the details in the film. Uh, it didn't fill everything in. It just, it left things uh, for us to consider. There was a lot of reflective moments in the film, a lot of framing and doorways and windows and, and phone booths, uh, all of these kinds of things. Uh, but I think it took us uh, through an interesting moment in time. Uh, and it framed, and, and through that moment, we were able to, to uh, see a cohesion of thought uh, and to understand that, you know, that the Jewish thinking at that time was as diverse as it, as it is today. It was as diverse as it is today when you think about it. Uh, but it's also, it also is, as any, any good film is, a warning sign a warning sign. And it was what's interesting about this is it's a warning sign for the German people. It wasn't written, it wasn't produced, and it wasn't presented as a warning sign for us, although it certainly is, although it certainly is. So with that, uh, I'd like to open it up to, to the discussion. And hopefully, uh, some of you will jump right in there. And I can't wait to see little hands go up or big hands go up. So uh, who wants to uh, volunteer themselves first? Who am I gonna look for? Do I see a hand? Yep. Ah, okay, Barbara Rovin. I always say that it's easy to say, it's hard to say one, two, three, but it's very easy to say three, two, one, because everybody has 20, 20 vision when you look back. And so, it's very easy. It's like the right time and the right place. My husband used to say, I could sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. So it's, it's a, I didn't see the movie, but I understand because I've been with you for like 25 years. It's very fascinating. And I don't know where the movie, not if you showed the movie or not, but how they were talking about if you're a patriot in Germany and you fought for the Germans does that make you a Nazi? Or what about people who don't agree with everything that goes on in Israel? Uh, you're an anti-Semite? I don't think so. So Jews are humans like everybody else. They're good and bad. I mean, so it was a lot to think about from the things that you said. And I had a mother-in-law that came here in 1920. She'd never say anything serious on the telephone, thinking people were listening in. We thought she was a little paranoid. But you know what? we think a little differently today because now they have with this artificial intelligence, people's voices that sound alike could be Shelley Isaacs, but it isn't really Shelley Isaacs. God, his voice sounds the same. And uh, a lot to think about. You know how I feel about you, Shelley, yes. bringing the movie to life. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. And I assure you, I am not, I, I hopefully I'm intelligent, but I'm not artificial. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Jackie. We, we both liked it a lot and said exactly the same thing you did about it could have easily been a play. I can see it on, on a play, but I wrote down two quotes and one was when uh, the grandfather said to family, the biggest battlefield on which a man can prove himself worthy. I love that. But the one that I thought made the biggest impact was when they said wanting to forget prolongs exile. The secret to salvation is to remember. And I think that's so very true. When we try to rewrite history, even if we don't like it and it's unpleasant, all we're really doing is just saying we don't like that. And so we don't want to recognize it, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen and it can happen again. So we do need to remember it. 
That's a, that's a, that's an excellent point. It's a great point. Uh, and, and, you know, while you're saying it, I'm thinking it doesn't just apply here. It applies also to what's going on, you know, with, with them, uh, rewriting history, with them banning history, all of these things are the same. They're, delay, they're, they're delaying the inevitable because it will come back to haunt us. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, you know, it is a terrible thing, but that, that's, I'm glad you, you remembered those two quotes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Tate. You got to unmute, Barbara. Here. Yeah, there you go. I, I think that since I've been attending these Zoom sessions so that I have come to a much a deeper appreciation of direction, which I, I don't think that I ever felt it before when I saw a movie. I was like, oh, that's nice, and this is fun, and oh, a happy ending or something. But I was just stunned by, by, by this movie. I loved the um, courses of the meal. I, I loved the, all of the personalities that, that came out in the discussions and that discussion of, of and you would just think of, you know, there, there must have been, you know, all kinds of families who had some kind of smart ass son who said, yes, this is going to make Germany great. I mean, I just, I was, I loved the movie. Thank you. And you're absolutely right. That's, that's where his zeal was coming from. I mean, he got caught up in it. Uh, you know, it's, it's when I was just an aside, when I was in graduate school, uh, we had seen a film called Triumph of the Will. I'm sure some of you've heard about it. It was it was Hitler's uh, coming out in Nuremberg. Uh, he had faced thousands and thousands of people. It was all planned. It was this great epic film uh, documentary that was made with his speeches and everything else. And when we saw it in graduate school, you could look, you could see on on faces of the students who were sitting there, regardless of who they were. It was like the, you you could you could hand out a petition and it would sign up. Uh, that's how convincing that film was. And when you talk about the direction of the film, uh, to to your point, is it was very well directed because if you notice, he didn't just zero in on faces when they were talking. He would show the whole table. He would show the side of the table. He would, he would, you know, the camera wouldn't just capture one face. He would see reactions. He would see, and and that's very important. So it is like a play. We're 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 able to see the stage. Uh, he was very aware of his stage. So thank you. That's terrific, Rachel. Okay, I loved the film too. Initially, I got to be honest. I thought I really don't want to watch this because. My dad is a Holocaust survivor. So I'm saying, okay, you know, I, I, and then it was such a different perspective of a time and everybody at the table had different viewpoints and their personalities unfolded as the meal unfolded. You knew who they were and they were all well established by dialogue and, and, and that was so wonderful. That shows a sign for me of a good film. When the dialogue tells what type of characters all these people were. And I, I thought it was a great movie, um, a very well acted. The cinematography, I actually looked it up and it won some awards for mm -hmm. cinematography. Um, and I, it was also every meal, I was looking at it for the symbolism of the meal. Like when they say root vegetables, well, like this is the root of the problem, also the root of Germany. So, and then when it gets to dessert, it's the blood red, Yes, you know? So I, I noticed the symbolic of it also. And I just really was very glad I watched it. And, you know, and my dad was, always fearful that history is going to repeat that itself and it has with Rwanda and things like that and it upset my dad so greatly that there's still genocide that was going on and nobody was doing anything about it so you know uh so it was just a wonderful movie and on one thing I did note I was almost turning it off when they were doing the credits 
because uh-huh. I'm thinking, okay, this is the end of the movie. Uh-huh. And, but then <laughs> you see everybody, I went back in and right. I see everybody, what happens on the aftermath. Yeah. And uh, it was very good. Yeah, yeah, it was it was very good. It was very good, and and you know, it, it also the irony of the 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 closing the closing credits of what's going on in Berlin. You know, how many Jews have returned, and and a great number of young people from Israel have emigrated to Berlin. Uh, and I have a feeling many more may be doing that today, uh, as a result of what's going on. Uh, it's very interesting how, how things turn, the ironies uh, of life uh, and how they're acted out, uh, especially, you know, in, in Germany today. Uh, so, yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Linda. I have a question. Um, I agree with everyone, but I wanted to know, maybe I missed it, why the rabbi wanted an abbreviated um, prayer before the meal and he wanted it to be after the meal? Was there something there that I missed? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I remember it happening. Uh, no, um, I don't. Uh, but although although for him to, you know, when we think about it symbolically, maybe there's, there's a point to it. Uh, you know, in the fact that I wanna make the, the I wanna make a blessing after the meal. Uh, as opposed to before, you know, in terms of, you know, maybe maybe it's it's uh, a a comment on survival. I have no idea. I you have know, no idea. Maybe my history is off, but protocols of the elders came from Russia, not Germany. And the one that brought it to the states was Henry Ford. He took a liking to it got his presses going and distributed them. And it's ironic that it's still being talked about, it's still being used. Um, and Mein Kampf is read by, by many, it's a bestseller. And what bothers me as a Jew is that I can't imagine how 2% of the world population um, could be held responsible in people's thoughts of what either the, the people are doing or plan on doing or manipulating. It's, it's just very hard for me to, to picture that, that 2% of the population is being <laughs> accused of having all this power. Uh, well, you know, Linda. You, who's talking? I, I don't know the, how to get- Oh, Wendy, go ahead, Wendy. I don't, oh. I, I just want to say that anti-Semitism has been around for 3,000 years, and it always rears its ugly head when there's an economic downturn, and there's always somebody who will pick up the strains of what people are thinking and feeling because they're envious or they're wondering, how come these Jews did A, B, C, and D, and we can't? And that's an old story, and I found this film marvelous. This, mm-hmm. ha- this film happened in the room where I lived. I'm from Vienna, Austria, and I remember clearly there were many people talking about what Hitler was doing and it would pass, they said it would pass. And many people had businesses and they had relatives and they had families. They didn't wanna leave, they couldn't leave because their whole life was involved with Austria and, and Germany. And, it, and then you needed an exit visa and you needed an entrance visa. But these were hard to get. It was very hard to get out and of course, the Germans, of course, they, they um, Aryanized people's businesses. They took their homes, they took their belongings. It was, it was a deliberate and a successful attempt on their part to, to destroy our society in, in, in Western Europe. And you know, Angela Merkel, when she wrote her book, she says she said the German people have a debt that they can never, never repay because of what they did. And she doesn't call it the Holocaust. She calls it the Shoah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, Wendy, you know, you, you bring up so many points because, you know, first of all, what we're looking at is a group of people in the film who were German Jewish. They were German. They yes. thought of themselves as German. How could their country turn on them? You know, this is the, the thought. You know, now we jump ahead to our time. 
And, you know, did we ever think, could we ever fathom the idea that as Americans, as American Jews, we would even think about wanting to leave. We would think about, would we have to leave? Uh, this, is what, this is what's occurring because I hear this in conversation. I hear it in Excellent. conversation. You know, Linda, you, you bring up the idea of, of understanding how, how it, it is hard to fathom that people are, you know, they think these things they don't act on them. They did in 1933. They began to act on them because a political leader said it's time to act on them. Mm -hmm. Enough talk. Let's act. Well, but we're she, getting that today. We're getting that she, today. We I'm heard. I'm, I'm we, sorry, Wendy. I'll be with you in a second. We're getting that today because we have political leaders who are telling groups to act. To act, right. so right. we're we're you know, and you're not wrong about Mein Kampf because I'm sure there are certain politicians that carry it in their pocket. Uh, because I see it, I studied it uh, in graduate school, so I know what's in that book, and I know some of the words that are in that book, and I hear them, I hear them, and I don't like what I hear, uh, but it's true. It's Another true. Another thing, Shelley, you know. There was no Israel. It was Palestine. All right. It was Palestine. You know, the Turks were in there. So even the people that were thinking they have to leave, where were they going? Exactly. Where would they go? Where would they go? Uh, you know, it's 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 very difficult when you grow up in a country and you're part of that country to just pick up and go. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's to give up your culture, so to speak. Uh, and that's what yes, when. Times have changed. When you have an ex-president saying there are good in Charlotte, there are good people on both sides. That was a dog whistle to all those people who have this anger and vitriol and were just looking for an angle, and he gave it to them. That's that, that, that's already old. Think about what he said last night. Last night he said how wonderful Putin and, and Xi are. <laughs> I mean, and, and Kim yeah. Jong-un, I mean, they're wonderful people. They're great leaders. Uh, <laughs> whoever thought we would hear somebody saying that, that they hold a position like that. I mean, this is, you know, it's 50 years from now, it'll be played out as a farce. It's being played out as a farce now on Saturday nights. But, uh, you know, the first time it's tragedy. You know, it's, uh, it, 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 was, it was Mark said it. History plays itself out twice. First time is tragedy, second time is farce. Uh, you know, uh, I just hope we're around to see the farce. Uh, Jackie. Just wanted to comment, this is Larry. Just wanted to comment yeah, on a couple of things. Uh, that, that opening statement by the Sun talking about, you know, Hitler saying what the people want to hear. Uh, you know, honestly, you look at some of the current politicians, and to me, it's rabble rousing. And, and, and I've studied a lot with World War II and, and with Hitler, and I mean, that was all he did. You know, he he went for the uneducated. He went for people that he could stir and excite. And you're seeing the same thing today. Some of the things you're talking about. You know, if you, I, I'm of the age that I looked at, at politicians and our political leaders as supposedly the educated people, the intelligent people, and, and the people that were broad-minded and could. Put a country together and work with other countries and today we've got people that just if they can stir up enough people they can get some votes and you know who cares what they do ultimately you know it's all about the vote and just making the noise yeah yeah uh point well taken i mean and and you know you know as you say they're rabble rouses but it's it's they get you know, with, when the economic situation as as uh, wendy brought up when the economic situation is bad People look for an excuse. They you know, or or the rabble rouser looks for that excuse to control the mob, so to speak. Uh, and that's what's been happening. You know, whether it's aimed at Jews, whoever it's aimed at. You know, right now the Republicans are aiming it at everybody. Uh, so it's it's everybody's fault as far as they're concerned, but theirs. Uh, so we have these problems. We have these problems. I just want to, you know, a number of people have been writing in, in, the, in the chat. Uh, uh, Brenda Asher, I want to thank you. Her son is a film director, and she mentioned because uh, I think it was Rachel brought it up, the end credits. Uh, 
yes, we all should watch the end credits of the film. Those names are there for a reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and these people have all contributed to making the film. Now, I'm not saying you have to sit there through a Marvel film and watch all the animators' names and everything else, but I think for films like this, for films that we appreciate, it is important uh, because you'll see those names again and again in films very much like it, and you'll be able to understand the craft itself. Uh, you know, when somebody makes a great film, they're going to go on and make more great films, and you could see their their you could see their style. You could see, and it helps you in understanding film and understanding style. Uh, you know, you look at a person as simple as Alfred Hitchcock. You know, now I'm I'm in my film mode right now. But you look at somebody like Alfred Hitchcock, and you look at who did his music. Same person, Bernard Herrmann brilliant composer. You look at who did his set design, same person, who he wrote with, uh, very few people, but the same people. And you'll see those styles recurring again and again if you like his filmmaking. And it goes with any filmmaker you like. You will see they put together a group of people uh, that will help them express these creative ideas. So it is, I do, I do, I am a big proponent of reading the credits. Thank you, Bob, Brenda. Uh, also, uh, yes, Jackie, a protocol was given out, oh, Larry, the protocol was given out with every Model T. Uh, that was a fact. Rockefeller was, Rockefeller was one of the biggest proponents of the elders of Zion. Uh, right. He and Edison, uh, they would all get together. They had meetings uh, about that. Uh, that's an own historical fact. Uh, we get all of this. Uh, I just want, I, Carol Sassoon has a great comment. Uh, she would, uh, keep a valid passport and cash on hand. Uh, she keeps a valid passport and cash on hand. You never know, uh, because her father always told her, you never know what could happen. Uh, yeah, especially when, when our parents, grandparents came from somewhere else. So we can understand the comment, uh, all of these things. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I, boy, I'm seeing more. Uh, who is this? Oh, Mel, Mel and Marilyn, where are you? I don't see you up on the screen tonight, but I know you're there. I, I see you, Mel and Marilyn. Do you want to talk about what you said? Was it Marilyn? I, I guess they're not they're not listening. No, they Shelly, uh, they said their mic is not working. Oh, no. oh, I didn't understand. I thought she was talking about somebody she knew named Mike who's not working. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, okay, but she wanted to add that the reformed Jewish movement in Germany was adamant about not having a Jewish state. They were German first and did not feel that a Jewish state should exist. Only after the Nazi movement did the movement reverse its course and wanted a Jewish state. That's Mel talking. Uh, yes, Mel, that was, and there was some evidence of that in the film uh, about, you know, even Aaron not wanting his daughter to go, um, you know, to, to, to go there. Uh, it wouldn't be safe for her. Uh, you know, it's, it's yes, and of course, Brenda, you're right, that there was a, a sort of arrogance uh, among German Jews, uh, and, and that caused a big problem, that this did cause a big problem during that period. Uh, I, I, uh, any, anyway, and uh, we have, yes, Ford was the other, was the third one of that triumvirate. It was Edison, Ford, and Rockefeller. Um, so it's, it's uh, <laughs> thank you, Linda. And Linda said her grandparents always told her to have gold on hand. Yes, it's easy to carry. It's easy to carry. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you all for your comments. Uh, yes, and IBM certainly helped. <laughs> yes, that's true. A lot of companies helped. I will remind you, the Warner Brothers were selling films to the Nazis up until 1938. They were still doing business with the Nazis. Uh, there were Nazis who were here in Hollywood uh, trying to censor films uh, so that they wouldn't get a bad rap in the United States. I mean, this is this all, there's a lot, of, a lot of background information you can find on all of this. A lot of it, a lot of it. Uh, so anybody else have anything they wanna add? 
Um, uh, I just I, want, to, um, yes, I want to say something that I know most people who are Jewish think of themselves as Jewish, but to the Gentile world, you're considered Jewish and you're an American. If you think of yourself as an American and then Jewish, that the rest of the world doesn't think of you that way. It, it's something that's inherent, intrinsic in people. And that's why Jewish people have been easily identified because of who they are. And the German Jews wanted to be so German, they wanted to outdo the Germans and they didn't. And they were called out for it and the Holocaust. Yes, yeah, true, true, very true. Uh, but Brenda, I wanted to ask you about your about your son. Are there any films we could see? Yes, um, he was just feted a week ago at U of Miami, his alma mater, where he did a master class and showed his last movie, A Glitch in the Matrix, which was played two years ago at the Cinema Paradiso. Um, uh -huh. I have a picture of myself out in front of the movie theater there. Um, and it's on Netflix and the nightmare was before that. These are all kind of in the horror or the real world that happens to people. And then the first one was room 237. And um, that was the one that everybody was acclaimed and he got standing ovation in Khan. And oh, that's terrific. I been there. And I've been to, um, um, uh, to the film festival in Utah uh, you know, and then the one in Austin, West by uh, South, South by Southwest with the my West, daughter yeah. to see uh, Nightmare and then to see Room 237 in, in Sundance. And so, um, yeah, he's a graduate of U of Miami. And we moved here when he was 14 to uh -huh. Hollywood. I'm the, Jew, I'm the Jew that sent my son to Catholic high school, Chaminade. Uh <laughs> I wouldn't send him, I wouldn't send him to South Broward. Uh. <laughs> and, he, and they even gave him scholarship money. They liked him so much. And they uh, even invited him for dinner all the time because he was the resident artist. Don't ask. Oh, uh, very but nice. they didn't convert him. Okay. <laughs> it's nice to have people tell about their children, especially when they're in film. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nora. Oh. Uh, uh, two two points. One is, I, I thought it was interesting because you learn that the Germans Jews had warning, where Jews in other countries uh, didn't have any warning of what was going on. And I, I think that was a distinction. More German Jews survived than, say, Polish Jews. And um, the second thing is, I, I disagree with you politically completely. And I, I think the Democratic Party is a party to be aware to be scary of uh, when you're Jewish. And, uh, I, and I, I think you should all think about Iran and the nuclear bombs that they have. And uh, Trump yesterday said that these other leaders like Putin uh, were very smart for their countries. He didn't say they were wonderful people to socialize with and I'm gonna have a party with them. He said they did wonderful jobs for their countries and we should do a wonderful job our country. Well, I, I, I mean, this is a, this is a debate we can have for a long time. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to get too far into it. Uh, but the 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 ideas uh, of of uh, your first point, uh, which which uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember now. What was your first point? The first was point, would... German Jews had warning. Yeah. They saw yeah, what they... was going on. They had warning where, where like, say, a Polish Jew, like they said, oh, that's happening in another country. It's like when we see uh, Mexican gangs, we go, oh, that's happening in Mexico. It's not going to happen in the United States. So it, it's it's they had they had warning. That's why so many did get out percentage wise compared to Jews from other countries. Not yeah, no, know. I now I remember what you were saying. It's it's we should be afraid of the Democrats. Well, I'll be honest with you, we should be afraid of both parties uh, exactly. at the present moment. Uh, right. I I don't think either one is functioning quite right. Uh, is is the problem, and we're hearing now from the youth in this country finally, uh, and I think that's what's important. Is and and I think both you know both parties are complicit. 
uh, because I'm seeing it in our educational system. And that's where they're, what they're attacking most of all. And if they keep rewriting history and keep banning books, we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is what I see as a bad future. Uh, right, but as far as, yeah. as far as Trump is concerned, I understand your point of not saying, although he has socialized with them and he would be happy to socialize with them. That, and I think even though he says, even though he says that, that they're good for their people, I don't know how good they are because a man who makes war on another nation is not being good to his people. Uh, he's killed a good number of his own people with this war on the Ukraine. Uh, and she I mean, has also systematically has systematically imprisoned or in camp a good size of his population as well. So, uh, so we and I don't know have, if that's a good idea. <laughs> we, we buy all our material from China. Look around your home. Everything's from China. And we should, not, we should not communicate with them. I mean, it's no, like no, no, no. I think I think the Chinese people as a whole. Uh, are, are, are more interested, they're not interested in the politics. They look down when it comes to politics because they don't want to become subject to it because there is no political party, because they're under oppression. They're under an oppressive party and they look down. They don't get involved in the politics. The majority population does not get involved in the politics. They don't want to because they have enough trouble putting food on the table. And I think that's what's, what's uh, crucial to both our countries is we have to deal we have to deal with the economic situations and we we can deal with those people there are traders there are marketers there are merchants that aren't involved in politics that's one thing every but, company in china is under the communist rule every company not every has to, every company has to sign that the communist rule uh, reigns over everything they do including apple but they they were but the, the, the Chinese companies were permitted uh, before Xi were permitted to operate in an independent market. That's how they made all their money. Right. They were allowed to, to understand the economics of the situation. Let's uh, show it. Let's, yeah, let's, let's get back to the movie. Thank you. Let's get back yes. to the movie, please. Can we get back to this. Movie? Yes, absolutely. I just, I'm I sorry. That. I apologize. No, it's not yes, you, Sean. I just wanted to say something. I really um, enjoyed Rachel's comments about the menu. I thought that that yeah. was so insightful because it was very clear in the beginning and it yeah. murked up as we got into all the discussion about the people. And I think that um, it was very, very well done because this was something, when you talk about the uh, Jews in Poland and other places, they lived in little communes. They were really out of it. They were not into the society. But we're talking about the German Jews were intricate part of a society and thought they were absolutely German first and Jews second. And I think that was a very important thing. And I, I liked the idea of all the different points of view of the people. And even though it was a, a point that, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. they didn't know really. But the feelings that Hitler was just not gonna be good for some of them, it was marvelous. So I, I really thought the film was well presented really well presented. Okay, so the Jews in Poland were not all from shtetls. My mother was a city girl from Warsaw. I didn't mean all of them, Nora. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I'm There's just a saying. lot of them. My father had a big business. His family had big business in Celts. My mother's father had parents had a factory in Warsaw. So I, I just, just didn't want you to generalize. Okay. I'm yeah, sorry. Well, well, all right, uh, Susan, thank you, thank you. Nora, both of you, I want you to understand something. What was happening was what the Germans did, what Hitler did is, and, and we're talking, you know, this is 1933. All this stuff didn't come down the road until a few years later. And the point was that they made Poland, they made Czechoslovakia, they made Hungary, they made them stateless they went in and they created statelessness. And when you create statelessness, you create chaos. And when you create chaos, you are allowing people to start acting on their emotions. And that's what happened in Poland. That's what happened in Czechoslovakia is those groups began to act that way. But that's history. 
I don't want to get into that discussion. We're in the film. Susan's right. As far as the film is concerned, yes, you got all these points of view of, of these Germans who were living in Germany at the time and their feelings about what was happening at that moment. And I think, you know, yes, the food was a big part of the reflection, but it's also, I think the food is important for us as memory, as memory. How many of us have been subject to these dishes or being told about these dishes? I mean, when I, I've shown this film a number of times and when I've shown it, some people, you know, uh, uh, some of us uh, and, and even older people would say, uh, I remember when we were served these things. Uh, so it's a connection. It's a connection that's something that didn't go away. You know, for, for a lot of them, it disappeared because they would disappear. Uh, and, and yet we see it and we, could, we, we see it as symbolic of something. The same way we sit down, we sat down last week at the Passover table. Those foods are symbolic. And these foods were symbolic and he purposely put them in there because of what they symbolize. Uh, you know, they, they, they were a mainstay of food uh, for these families. Uh, so Susan, thank you for bringing it up again. I appreciate it. Uh, Jackie. I just wanted to say great movie. So what's on board for next time? Cause we could argue this over and yes. over and over. So what's our next movie, buddy? Thank you. You could be sorry you asked. Uh, <laughs> no, the next film on April 26th is 1945. So, and this was purposeful on my part because Last Supper takes place before the Holocaust, takes place before any of these events uh, of history. 1945 takes place afterwards afterward and it is a uh, very interesting film in the way it's crafted i mean this is about filmmaking uh it's a film in black and white it comes to us from uh from hungary uh very interesting young director and and a young writer uh but anyway two mysterious strangers dressed in black appear at the railway station in a small hungarian village Within a few hours, everything in that village will change. Everything in that village will change. It is about memory. It is about haunting memory. It is about what happened during the war. Uh, and, and the way it is filmed references uh, some great American films, but I will get into that when we see it. Uh, and you may even recognize it, but it is it is a, a an interestingly crafted film. It's won a tremendous amount of awards, uh, and and the it speaks more words than it says in dialogue. Uh, but as I said, it's in black and white, it's in glorious black and white, uh, and the symbolism is is there. Uh, the acting is very good, uh, and it's another film to remember. So I hope. We will all gather on the 26th for a good discussion about that. Uh, it certainly it's, doesn't it's involve the politics. Yeah, go ahead, Wendy. Important film to watch. I urge everyone to see this film because it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in film. And it's done. It, 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 is, it is, and I will tell you, I will have some things from the writer and the director uh, that they've spoken about. Uh, it is very interesting. Rachel, did you have something you wanted to add? Yes, I just wanted to say, <clears throat> uh, I thank you for uh, having us watch this film and look at the controversy that we got from the film. What we should all take from it is what we feel and where we are going in the future. Not politics, but where we are in our country in our own country and the world. Where are we headed? And are, are we seeing some similarities throughout the world about this? And I thought this, the controversy was good. It is a discussion about how film can make us feel for the future, the present and the future. So I thank you for having this film and thank this discussion. You, yeah, and, and one thing to remember is, and I want you to understand is films will not, films don't change the world. They change the way we think about the world. 
and then what we can do as a result. Uh, but they themselves, they are vehicles for us to think and make change. Uh, and it's interesting that fiction narr fictional narratives can do more sometimes than documentaries, uh, can do more than, than documentaries. So I am glad you appreciated the film. I couldn't be happier. I am also glad by the discussion. Uh, I think it's healthy uh, for us to be able to air our feelings. Uh, so I will look forward to seeing you in two weeks. I thank you all for thank your participation. You. Thanks, Shelley. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Very good. I didn't say anything, but <laughs> thank you. I, 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 I will not, I will, I just want to say something. I will not be next time, but oh. I remember the but I remember the film. I saw oh. it in the movies. And I just remember that when my aunt went back to Poland to my mother's where my mother lived, where my grandmother's house was, and it was not. They didn't want to open the door because they thought that my aunt was going to ask for their house back. back. Like he was, yes. So it's it's in reference to the for the film. I, I remember yeah. the film very well. I yes, remember yes. Also, I remember a lot of the scenes and everything. And thank you for always bringing these incredible films. It, this was great. Thank, thank you. you thank so you, much, Shelly. Thank you. Thank Great you. My thing, pleasure. You thank you. Thank you. Be well. Bye. I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. You're on the same wavelength as my son. <laughs> thank you, Brenda. I saw that you. I gave you his link. You would hit it off. Oh, okay. Did you? Where is it? I'm looking for it. Uh, there it is. Okay, I got it. I copied it. Okay, great. I miss seeing the movie because where when did you show it? Uh